we're going to continue our discussion about managerial accounting. And last class we talked about course classifications and course behavior. We talked about fixed course and variable course. We said that variable course are course that vary with the production quantity which is different from fixed course. Very often students say fixed course are course that are fixed, which of course is true, but fixed course are course that don't vary with the production quantity within a certain relevant range. So course are fixed if you produce one unit. Course are fixed if you produce a million units. Course are fixed if you produce 10 million units, but at some point, you've gone outside the relevant range. So if you're producing 10 million units, then in that case you could say um, in uh, that manufacturing facility that the costs are fixed. Like for example, the rent or the interest payments or the property tax. But the reason why we say that within that relevant range, because once you go beyond the relevant range, which it could be 10 million units, it could be 15 million units, once we go beyond that, then what happens? The reason why we say it's not fixed anymore is because if you start making 15 million units now, maybe your insurance premium is now going to go up because the insurance company perceives that there's more risk now that you're producing 50% uh, more units. But otherwise, if you make 5 million or 10 million units, then the course is fixed on your insurance, for example. But once you go beyond that, and it could be 10 million, it could be 20 million, whatever the number is, then um, the course might vary. Now the unit fixed course, the unit fixed course will decline as the number of units produced increases. So the total fixed cost will stay constant within the relevant range, but the unit fixed cost is going to decrease because the more units that you make, the smaller the amount each unit produced is going to absorb. So if your total fixed costs are $10 million and you make one unit, then that one unit has to absorb the $10 million in fixed cost. If you make 10 million units, then each unit absorbs only one dollar. If you make 20 million units, then each unit only absorbs 50 cents. So the unit fixed course will decrease with the level of production, and the total fixed course, though, is going to remain the same. So we describe variable course and fixed course as course behavior. That's what we're trying to understand is course behavior so that we can make decisions. We need to understand if we're going to discontinue product line B or product line C or product line D, what's going to be the benefit? What course are going to go away and which course we're going to be stuck with? So in financial accounting, we spend a lot of time studying past performance. We're looking at how much sales we generate, how much income we generated. But in managerial accounting, we're focusing on the gathering information for us as executives to make decisions. So we're not looking at past performance. We're not trying to evaluate past performance. It's helpful to have data from the past, because like today, we're going to talk about calculating the predetermined overhead rate. So we need to make some assumptions about how much overhead a particular product is going to absorb. Because there's direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Now manufacturing overhead includes indirect costs. Indirect costs in this case are indirect materials and indirect labor. The reason why they're indirect costs is because we can't trace them to a particular product. So direct materials and direct labor, you can trace those to a particular product. So in other words, when you talk about direct materials, we know how much plastic we use to make a particular product. That's something that we could easily establish. 
But what about, for example, um, indirect labor such as the salary that we pay the plant manager? We know that we have that expense, but where, how do we capture that? Because it's a shared cost, right? The plant manager is responsible for managing all the production. So we need to have an overhead rate to assign those manufacturing overhead costs. So indirect labor is a good example of a cost that is part of manufacturing overhead that we would want to allocate. Direct labor are the people who are operating the machines in the factory. So you take this course, you develop your business plan, and you decide that you're going to manufacture a particular product. You need to understand what, a co what costs are associated with producing that product. How much are we going to pay laborers in the factory? Now the salaries that we pay laborers, that's direct labor. The salaries that we pay, and that's a product cost, the salaries that we pay the executives in headquarters or the salaries that we pay the salespeople, those are period costs. Those are non-manufacturing costs, which are also referred to as selling general and administrative. So we have to make a distinction. We have to be familiar with these different terms and classifications because they're going to help us make decisions. A classic decision is should we make or should we buy the product? How do we know? There's, I think, an assumption that buying a product or sourcing a product is the right thing to do. That's not always the case. You have to calculate the numbers and determine whether or not enough variable costs are going to go away that it makes sense to do that. So we need to understand, well, how much are we going to have to pay to buy the product from somebody else? And how much is it costing us now to make the product? Now you say, how much is it costing us now? Now you think we should know that. You say, what do you mean? How much, what do you mean how much does it cost to make the product? We don't know that? I've been in a lot of factories where they have no idea what it costs to make the product. And they price the product at a point where they think they could sell it and then a marketing organization could turn around and sell that to a retailer and hit a particular price point. But they really have no idea. And why? Because what we consider in accounting to be indirect and direct costs, costs that are easily traceable, even direct costs are challenging for, um, for some organizations to track. So we need to understand that. We need to be able to say, I know that this is how much my direct materials are for product A, and this is the direct labor, and this is the manufacturing overhead. These are my product costs, and you have to know that, okay, this is what it costs to make the product, and this is what it's going to cost to buy the product. And so we need to understand all these terms and classifications because if we don't know how to classify the cost, then how are we going to, if we can't even classify them, then how are we going to determine what our costs are? Because remember, the fixed costs are not going to go away. So you might think, well, if we discontinue this line, then we're going to, the company overall is going to benefit. Well, sales are going to decrease because of that. And we say, well, but our expenses are also going to decrease. But by how much? Because we're still going to have those fixed costs. And some costs we consider to be sunk. Some costs are those costs that we've already incurred that should not impact our decision to make or buy the product. So in other words, we've already spent a million dollars on equipment. That money, no matter what we do, if we continue to make the product, or if we decide to buy the product from, let's say we're going to source the product from Albania, then 
or Turkey, then those courses are still expensed. We, we can't hide from them. We're stuck with those courses. So we shouldn't consider that, oh, we spent a million dollars on equipment. Whether we discontinue the line or we continue to make the line, the million dollars is spent. So we, those costs are referred to as sunk costs. They shouldn't affect our future decisions. And it's challenging as managers because you keep thinking, but we spent a million dollars. I know, you spend a million dollars, but there's nothing you could do to change that at this point. So continuing to make the product, that doesn't necessarily help us. And if we don't make the product anymore, the fact that we spend a million dollars, that's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. So we need to understand those costs. But now what I want to talk to you about is the difference between process costing and job costing. Because they're not the same. So process costing, for example, is when a company produces many units of a single product. And they're basically the same. In fact, you could say that these products are identical. So process costing is when you're producing large quantities of a single product that's identical. So what that means is that we know what the costs are. We have a process. We know very well how much direct materials we're using, how much direct labor, what the manufacturing overhead costs are. Why? because we're making them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we've already made 50 million of them, we know what our costs are. So, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about process costing because um, we, we have that information. That's what we talked about last time is, what are the direct materials, what is the direct labor, what is the manufacturing overhead, and that's what tells us our total manufacturing cost. So that's assuming, and the reason why we could talk about that and those numbers, and we kind of take that for granted, is because we have a process costing system in place. So we're making millions and millions of the same unit. But job order costing is when we're making products that are unique. So that means each job, essentially, we need to cost out each job. So for example, every, every um, job is made to order. What would be a good example? For example, a wedding dress. So if you're going to, if you have a business, and this is what, um, even though we're talking about accounting and we're talking about it from an accountant's perspective, this is what small business people do, even if they don't realize that it's job order costing. What happens if you go to a seamstress and you say, I'm getting married and I want a dress. But you don't want, you're not going to buy your dress at Macy's. Macy's is a very successful company, and it's a nice place to shop, but you decided that you want to have your dress made for you. And there's certain components and aspects about the dress that you want it to have. So you saw the royal wedding, and you've got some ideas in your head, and so you go to a seamstress, and you say, this is what I want. And this is what I want the neckline to be, and this is how much lace, and so on. Well, how does the seamstress know what to charge you? So what the seamstress is gonna do is basically job order costing. Now, probably, unless the seamstress took this course, probably the, the seamstress doesn't realize that that's what she's doing. But in, a set, in, in, in reality, she, every job she's costing out. Each dress is unique. 
because Christina has um, certain aspects of the dress that she wants, and Matilda has certain aspects of the dress that she wants, and each dress is unique. That's the key about job order coursing. You say, well, how do I know if we're doing job order coursing? Well, if each job is unique, then it's job order coursing. Now, we still need to find out the same information. We're still going to make the same decisions and assumptions around, basically, what are we trying to figure out? The total manufacturing course, which means what? We need to know what is the direct materials. So that means how much cotton are we using? How much lace? are we using? How much linen are we using? So how many yards of linen are we using to make the dress? For example. <laughs> the same that we would in process coursing. Except for that, we know, because we make the same dress. We make a million dresses, and the only difference is some are small, some are medium, some are large. But we know that, because why? Because we're making 500,000 small, and 500,000 medium, and 500,000 large. And so we know how much direct materials we're using. We know the direct labor. So we know how long the people are at the sewing machines, how long it takes them to make a dress. And we know, because we're an ongoing concern, we know what is the manufacturing overhead associated, which remember, the manufacturing overhead is the indirect materials and labor. Because remember, indirect costs are those that are difficult to trace back to a particular product. So in that factory, we might be making things other than dresses. Maybe we're making um, also shirts. But we still have one plant manager. So we need to somehow account for that. But that situation where we're making a large quantity of a single item, which is pretty much identical, that's process costing. But you could make, if you're making dresses that are unique, that are custom order, that's job order costing. Do you see the difference? So you don't know. You don't know beforehand how much direct materials is going to be used to make Christina's dress. You don't know how much direct materials are going to be used to make Benita's dress. That's something that we gotta, when we, the person comes in, we gotta be tell, you know, do some estimates based on what they tell us their requirements are. So if it's a custom job, then that's job order costing. And so we need to have a, what we refer to as a cost sheet, a job cost sheet. And the job cost sheet is one that lists and a space for us to list how much direct materials we're going to use, how much, how long it's going to take us to make the dress. Now, to make Christina's dress, it might be twenty-five thousand dollars. To make Matilda's dress, it might be thirty-five thousand dollars. So I'm assuming that we were going to have it made by Vera Wang. No. So, but you know, Vera Wang, they sell her dresses at, um, her clothes at um, Target, not Target, Kohl's. So you have to be careful because, you know, when you go to your wedding and you say, oh, let me tell you something about job order costing. Um, my professor explained that to me and I, you know, even on my wedding day, I'm still thinking about this. You know that my dress, my dress, is an example of job order coursing. My dress is um, a Vera Wang. And they say, I shop at Kohl's too. <laughs> and so, so you, need to, you need to think of that. What about um, another example of where you would use job order coursing is, for example, if um, you're painting, you're hiring a painter. Painters, use job order costing because let's say they're going to paint um, the inside of your house. You tell them you want to paint the bedrooms. So in one house they go in there and there's two bedrooms. Another house, there's three bedrooms. Somebody else's house, there's four bedrooms. 
Some houses have five bedrooms, some have six, seven, eight bedrooms. So they want people to ask them, well, how much is it going to cost to paint my bedrooms? But they can't say $1,500. They need to do a job order course sheet. And so they look at the square footage. Well, one person has two bedrooms, so the square footage is less. Another person, we said, has six bedrooms. The square footage is a lot more. And then, so you say, well, why? I don't get it. Like, why do we care? Why? The reason why we care is because in order for us to set a price at which we could be profitable, we need to know how much it's costing us. And we can't just think about how much, um, how much linen we're using to make the dress. Certainly, direct materials could be a significant portion of the product cost. But how many hours is it going to take us? How much, how much labor is involved? And what about the manufacturing overhead? Because we need to think about that. Because we might be able to cover the variable cost, but then we forgot to take into account the fixed cost. So keep in mind that period costs, which are the selling general and administrative, and product costs can be both variable and fixed. That's just cost behavior. So a period cost can be fixed or it could be variable. And the same applies for product costs. So if we're going to price out a dress, we need to understand what are our non-manufacturing costs, if you will? What are our period costs? What are our selling general administrative? Because if we price it just enough to cover the direct materials and direct labor, but then we don't take into account the fact that we have um, rent that we have to pay, suppose we have a, a dress shop, we have to make sure that we're taking that into, a, into account and that each dress that we sell is going to cover a portion of the rent. So that's why cost is so important, especially as entrepreneurs and small business people, you need to know how much it costs you. So you say, oh, I want to make sandwiches. Great. We're going to open up a sandwich shop. We're going to open up the Bassel sandwich shop. And we, guys, we're going to, we're going to form a Subchapter S Corporation, and you're going to all be um, shareholders in that corporation. I'm going to give you all shares in, in the corporation. So I'm going to divide up the shares amongst myself and everybody on our team. So all of you, you're going to get 45%, and I'm going to get 55%. Okay? So I'm not going to give up control over the company. <laughs> right, Khalil? Come on, come on. I was born at night, but not last night, right? <laughs> come on. So we're going to open up this sandwich shop, right? Sounds, why not? Why not open up a sandwich shop? But then when you start to think about it, right, it's never as simple as it seems. Each sandwich is unique, right? Isn't this job order course thing? Each sandwich is unique. How do you know how much to charge for a sandwich? Now, at the end of the day, we could have a whole pile of money in the register. Maybe we're selling sandwiches for $5 or maybe even $10. But how do we know if that's enough to cover our costs? And that's why I want to take the time to talk to you about costs, because it's not as simple as it sounds to say, well, what are my costs? Tell me. That's what we need to know. How much, how much are our costs? Because we need to cover all of our costs. Ultimately, we want to be profitable. So if we're going to be profitable, that means we need to cover all of our costs. The direct costs and the indirect costs. The period costs and the product costs. So the rent, we have to pay the rent. So maybe $5 is not enough for a sandwich. And you say, well, maybe nobody would buy sandwiches for $10. Well, maybe, maybe that means that we can't have a sandwich shop. <laughs> not with your brand name technique. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's, it's important. Well, a lot of times we focus um, in the marketing class, we spend a lot of time talking about the price. <laughs> we talk a lot about price, about penetration pricing strategies and skimming um, 
pricing strategies and prestige pricing strategies. But how could you know what price to charge unless you know what your costs are? And we need to know what all the costs are. So whether it's we're a painter, or you're a seamstress, or a sandwich shop operator, we need to know what our costs are. How much, how much lettuce are we using on the sandwich? How much is the bread? What about the tomatoes? And what about the rent and all the other um, expenses? So we need to understand that. Questions? So process costing is we're making a lot of a, of a identical product. And job order costing is when we're making unique, one-of-a-kind type items. So the three key documents that we need to be familiar with are the job cost sheet, the materials requisition form, and the employee time ticket. Job course sheet. Materials requisition. And the employee ticket. These are three important documents as relates to job costing. So the job course sheet for each job, for each unique job, we prepare a job course sheet. And that's where we document the manufacturing course. The direct materials, the direct labor, and the indirect materials and the indirect labor. So are we clear on the difference between direct course and indirect course? So direct costs are the costs that we could easily trace back to the particular product. And indirect costs are costs that we don't want to lose sight of them, but they're difficult to trace back to a particular product line. So they're usually some type of shared cost. The cost that we pay the janitor in the manufacturing facility. So they clean the facility for the entire, for all the product lines. So each product line has to absorb a portion of that course. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. I'm going to show you how to calculate the predetermined overhead rate. And we make some assumptions there. And then from an accounting perspective, what we look at is the overhead applied. Because remember, we're looking, we need this information to make decisions about the future. So we're going to have to calculate the overhead applied. Before we know what the overhead actually is, we have to make some assumptions. So we're going to calculate based on an allocation base, which could be what we expect the machine hours to be, the total number of machine hours, 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours, 50,000 hours, whatever it is, or the number of labor hours. And what that's going to give us is a certain dollar amount per hour. And the reason why that's so helpful to us is because when we're looking at different opportunities and we're trying to make different projections and we're going through different scenarios, then if we know that the manufacturing overhead rate is, let's say, $8 an hour, then we could look at different scenarios and say, well, what if because we're going to do a lot of what ifs. We need to be making some projections. What if we operate the machines 10 hours? Or what if we operate the machines 10,000 hours? 
or 20,000 hours, or 30,000 hours, or 40,000 hours, or 50,000 hours. But what do we do with that? Like, okay, that's all right, whatever. Like, but no, if we know that we have an overhead rate of $8 an hour, then we can say, okay, if it's 10,000 hours, then 10,000 times eight is $80,000. And if it's 20,000 hours, then it's $160,000. And if it's 50,000 hours, then it's $400,000. Now, do you see how that's helpful as a manager? How that's gonna help us make decisions? Because we can't wait until after the fact. Remember, we're not looking at past performance as managers. We need to use what's called managerial accounting to make, to gather information to help us make decisions. So we need to know, have a sense beforehand, what is the overhead rate going to be? Because remember, I said we need to decide how much are we going to charge for the dresses? How much are we going to charge for those sandwiches? How much are we going to charge people to paint their house? So we need to have some sense. Now, sometimes our estimates could be off, and we're going to have a variance. So sometimes we're going to be, our manufacturing overhead is going to be over-applied, and sometimes it's going to be under-applied. So sometimes it might be favorable, and sometimes it's going to be unfavorable. If it's favorable, if we have a favorable overhead variance, what that means is that we anticipated that the amount of overhead was going to be $400,000. But actually, it turned out to be not $400,000, but $300,000. Well, if that's the case, then we were very efficient in the way we operated the organization. And so we need to make an adjusting entry to address that. So that's a good thing if we have a favorable variance. Hopefully it's not going to be off too much because we like to think that it's within some, you know, if we're making a, um, an estimate, we shouldn't be guessing, right? We have some historical data that tells us it's going to be $8 per machine hour or $8 per labor hour or $20 per labor hour. So if the numbers are very far off, although it, we may be happy at first because we're, we feel like, wow, it's actually cost us less than what we thought, but then we should challenge ourselves and go back and say, well, how come we're so far off? So we need to, it makes sense to do those calculations. Because when we put together a business plan, we need to do a sensitivity analysis. One of the things that's going to be compelling to investors, and that's the main role for a business plan, is to get investment. So we use that as a tool. It doesn't include everything. It doesn't include all our strategies and all our tactics. It's a tool, it's a document that we use to scam people into giving us money. I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> in order to get people to invest in our um, endeavor. So one of the things that's going to be very compelling is when we could say, the best case scenario, we expect to achieve sales of $780,000 per month. The most likely case is $620,000 per month. And the least likely case, or the worst case scenario, is that we would achieve $485,000 per month in sales. Now that's going to impress investors. Because anybody could take a business plan and put down, we're going to have sales of $1.5 million per month. I mean, what, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Anybody could make it look like it's going to be a profitable business. But the numbers have got to be real. And that's why I said numbers like, like what, what did I say? Like, you know, realistic numbers, not 500,000 or a million, right? I said like 720,000 per month. You said, well, why not say three quarters of a million? Well, is it three quarters of a million or not? 
So what's going to help us, and the re how we're going to, and that's just sales, right? So we're going to have to make some predictions about sales, but it's got to be based on something real. Like we have to show them that we're going to sell sandwiches at $9.99. That's, that's a good um, approach, right, to pricing. $9.99, or like Walmart likes to price their things at $9.97 or $9.98, right? Because that's less than $10. <laughs> $10 is much more expensive. So we're going to say we're going to sell our sandwiches at $9.99 and we're going to sell per week $1,215. Not $1,500. Why? Because how did you get $1,215? Well, what we did was we estimated that out of the 15,000 students at Brooklyn College that 10% of them are going to buy lunch each day, and that's 1,500. And then um, we don't expect that all 1,500 are going to buy our sandwiches um, each day, but out of that, we expect 10% to buy our sandwiches, which is 150, and 150 times seven days a week. So that's what they're expecting to see. That adds a lot of credibility to your business plan. If you could show them your assumptions, because again, anybody could say one million five hundred thousand dollars per month. Really? I, how? Like? How is that? Why should we think that that's possible or even reasonable? So you need to show a sensitivity analysis: the best case, the most likely, and the worst case. Now, that's just sales, but now we were talking, remember we were talking about costs. So the question is, well, what are our costs? Well, you need to be able to explain that in the business plan, what we just discussed. You need to be able to explain to investors, potential investors, that these are the costs, and that we did these calculations, and we said, well, at 50,000 hours, our cost would be 400 and $20,000, and at 40,000 machine hours, our course would be this. At that adds a tremendous amount of credibility to your business plan, because what investors have is money. What they don't have is usually knowledge about a particular industry. So you have to show them that you are the industry expert, that you know more about making sandwiches than anybody. And you may have gotten that experience by working in a sandwich shop, right? A lot of company, a lot of executives, they work for, um, for Subway or they, they have some experience in a particular industry and then they leave corporate America and they go off on their own. And they, investors look at, okay, well, what is your work experience? Like, have you ever managed a restaurant before? Have you ever made pizza? You know, you're probably eating pizza, but like, have you ever, like, do you know how a pizza shop operates? Or if you tell them that you want to um, invest and have a fleet of cabs, so they might ask you, have you ever driven a cab? Have you ever operated a cab or worked for a cab company? So that's something that we need to include in the business plan. So that's why I'm emphasizing this. Um, at this point, what, determining what our costs are. Not just because it's interesting to, to calculate, but because you need to include that in your business plan. And that's what we talk about in Chapter 8, is what are um, the components of a business plan. So you definitely have to have financial projections. And you need to have something compelling about sales, and you need to also have something compelling about and something credible as it relates to your course. So once you start telling them about, you know what the direct materials are, the direct labor, the manufacturing overhead, that shows that you're an industry expert. If you know that, then you're certainly an industry expert. And even if you have to estimate, of course, right, we said we don't know. We don't know exactly. But if you tell them, look, I went through 
and my coach helped me. We went through, we crunched the numbers, and we looked at these different labor hours, and this is what what the overhead rate is and what we're going to assign as the applied overhead. So let's continue. Questions? How investors calculate, what kind of techniques do we use to calculate risk? Side, cost? Well, it depends on the industry. They certainly look at the industry. So they're looking at the growth rate of the industry. The, so in other words, is the industry mature? Or is it growing? What is the size of the industry? So sometimes an industry can be uh, mature, which means that it's not growing, or it's growing at a very slow rate. So for example, the beverage industry. The beverage industry in the US usually grows about 2 to 3% per year, which is really, when we think about growth, that's not growth, <laughs> OK? That's basically a mature industry. When we talk about growth, we're talking about 20%, 50% growth and more per year. That's an industry that's experiencing growth. The industry is, uh, is mature, so we can say the industry is mature, but it's also very large. So the beverage industry um, in the U.S. is quite large. So they're going to look at, well, how large is the industry and how fast is it growing or is it not growing? Now, if the industry is mature, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. It depends on the industry because they're also going to look at whether or not the, the industry has competition that is highly concentrated or highly fragmented. So a highly concentrated industry is one in which there's a few competitors that control the market. Like wireless communication is an example of a highly concentrated market. Why do I say that? Because how many competitors basically dominate wireless communication in the US? We have AT&T, which is the market share leader. We have Verizon. We have Sprint and T-Mobile. No more T-Mobile. And, and, and no more T-Mobile, right? So basically three, four competitors. Now who else? I mean, wh whoever else is out there is really insignificant because those three or four control at least 90% of the market. Now that has certain implications, to your point. If you have four competitors that control 90% of the market, that means rivalry amongst those companies is very intense. Now if you have 100 companies, the market is highly fragmented, and you have 100 companies, that means you don't even, Benin is not even a blip on your radar screen. You don't even know Benin is out there selling wireless communication. That's a very different industry dynamic. So those are things that they look at in terms of risk and potential. Those are some of the, the factors that they consider. Um, you were talking about sensitivity analysis, like the best case scenario, most likely the worst. Is there like a certain percentage that you No, you just need to, um, you have to make some, um, some assumptions as to what would impact why you wouldn't achieve the best case scenario and what impact that would have on sales. So for example, you might anticipate that um, a new competitor might enter the market. So then you say, well, based on if a new competitor enters the market, then um, sales would actually be um, 20 percent less. So in other words, what if somebody opens up a sandwich shop next to ours? <laughs> now usually what happens is we sign a lease that says that the landlord can't rent to competitors. You've got to be very specific though to say direct competitors or indirect competitors. We need to specify that because they might say, oh well you are um, you sell hamburgers. Why would you care if we open up a KFC next to you? Well, do, do we care? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because even though they sell chicken and we sell hamburgers, it's basically it's fast food. Mm -hmm. So you should um, include that in um, in the lease. 
but that's something that maybe maybe the um, the landlord doesn't own the whole strip or the whole block. So you say, well, I'm going to rent this, but you don't know. They might, who knows what's going to happen. They might close the, the bagel shop and the other landlord might pull a fast one and rent to a subway. And that's going to have an impact. So we need to identify those potential risks. To me, it's very shocking that for um, all that while, they had a White Castle next to McDonald's. That is crazy. I don't know how, and now they're closed. So I'm only assuming, but I think it's reasonable to assume that the landlord was sued. And they finally, it was finally reached um, the, um, the court system, and it was resolved. But I can't believe that McDonald's would have not sued. I mean, you open up a White Castle next to a McDonald's. Now, it's not that clustering doesn't occur. Clustering does occur. Clustering is when similar businesses operate in close proximity to each other. So you'll see, like, on one corner you have a McDonald's, and just like, wow, isn't it bizarre? Across the street they have a Burger King and um, a KFC. But, okay, across the street, but, like, here's your door and there's their door. I mean, that's a little too close. Okay, that's, uh, yes, we're all competing in the same industry and for the same customer, but right next door, I'm really pretty sure that they got sued. That's why they closed. And it, it took them long enough. It's actually it's probably taken them like several years now. But I, I mean, you don't think that's outrageous? A White Castle right next door to a McDonald's. I mean, that's outrageous. I mean, there's no way. And I wouldn't think that. Now, if it's a different landlord, and they don't own that, that building, then, well, any, the landlord, they could rent to whoever they want. Right? But if it's the same landlord, now they could have done something, you know, creative too. They might have, like, sublet it to another company or sold it or set up some sort of, you know, um, shell corporation or holding company or something. But it is what it is. I mean, you could easily unwind that and show that that's what they did. Because if they were the landlord for 25 years, then you could be able to, to document that. You'd be able to get records that show that and then show how, well then, you know, they sold it to his brother, who's the president of this recently created corporation. I mean, come on. I mean, you're that desperate to have put a White Castle in there? I mean. <laughs> But apparently, they were. Because otherwise, I can't, I really, I just can't see how they would, um, how they would allow the landlord to do that. Especially, I mean, even if it was chicken, if it was KFC or Pizza Hut, at least you could argue, you could, that you could argue, you could say, well, no, no, they're indirect competitors, they're not direct competitors, but two hamburger places, you're paying, you know, McDonald's, I'm sure they're paying. You'd be surprised what even at the Flatbush, what small shops are paying per month. Small shops, like smaller than this room, are paying five to $8,000 a month. You could imagine what McDonald's is paying per month for that large space, and then for the landlord to just poke them in the eye and open up a white castle right next door is pretty outrageous. So we have the job course sheet. The job course sheet is going to show our course for a particular job, for a particular dress, for a particular painting project. But then we need to have the materials requisition form. The materials requisition form is a form that we use to get materials from the warehouse. So if it's a manufacturing facility, for example, or even if it's a service industry, you're going to need to get supplies. Now, if you're a, even a, a, a small um, business and you have, we're going to have different types of inventory. We're going to have raw materials. We're going to have working uh, process, 
which we often refer to as WIP. And we're going to have finished goods. If you have, if you're operating a business and you have a thousand cans of white paint and a thousand cans of off-white paint, or you have, let's say, uh, 5,000 yards of linen for a dress and 5,000 yards of lace, then that's a significant value. That could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars worth of inventory. So you don't have that just like lying around the facility or your dress shop. You have that's locked up. That's in a, a storehouse. Because otherwise, well, we have an old employees, they just every day take home a gallon of paint every day. <laughs> right? I mean, so you've got to, if you have, you know, 25,000 gallons of paint, it has to be locked up someplace. But then you say, well, the painters, they got to, they need paint to paint people's houses. So they need to fill out the materials requisition form, which says that, it, on it, it says what job they're working on. So it says that, let's say for um, painting, for example, they'll say that they're, this is uh, um, Orhan house paint job. And they say we need 20 gallons of white semi-gloss paint and we need 10 gallons of blue high gloss enamel paint. And that's how you that's how you get materials from the from the storehouse. And then we know, then we charge that back to that particular project. So every paint job is not going to be the same because, as we said, some might have two bedrooms, some might have four bedrooms, some might have ten bedrooms, and because Rahan more than likely has ten bedrooms, and maybe some um, customers say, you know, I tell them, well, if you're going to paint my house, you'll do one coat of paint. But Rahan, he thinks he's a shot caller, he says, I want two coats of paint on the walls. So even if we have the same number of bedrooms, which we don't, because I definitely don't have as many bedrooms as Rohan, you might still need more paint, more materials. So again, job order costing. No two jobs are going to be the same. And then in some cases, you pay a premium for color. So I might be happy to have my walls to be white, but what about you, Orhan? Maybe you want to have a little color in, in, your, um, in your bedroom, in your living room, right? Blue, right? Blue is good. It's a nice color blue. So maybe that paint, you have to pay extra for that. So we need to know. We need to know, again, what our costs are. So that's the form that we use. Then there's an employee ticket. This is a form where the employee indicates how many hours they worked on a particular job. So they say that I worked, um, let's say we go back to the dressmaking example. They said, I worked today I worked four hours on Christina's dress, and I worked two hours on Matilda's dress, and then I worked, also I worked two hours on Benita's dress, and one hour on Elena's dress, and also one hour on Joanna's desk. Dress. Dress. Okay, don't get nervous. <laughs> right? So that we know, remember, all of that is going to trace back to the particular job. So that's on one given day. We know what they, how the employees spent their time. Now for one person, if it's just, if, if, if Yusuf is the seamstress, then it seems manageable. 
But what about if we have, like, for example, in factories that I've been in China, they literally, literally have 500 sewing machines. So like from this end of the hallway, all the way to the other end of the hallway, 500 sewing machines lined up next to each other and all the way down the hall. And you have that many employees. And we're not making, but this is not process costing because that means that we're all making, what, they would all be making the same teddy bear either Tickle Me Elmo, or what's, what's, what's popular now? What is it? Sneakers. Sneakers? Nike sneakers. Nike sneakers. Um, but teddy bears, that's, that's teddy bears, what's teddy bears? Coach teddy bears, right? Coach teddy bears, right? Um, yeah, that's good. Or well, Barney, right, the uh, purple dinosaur. Yeah, they're, they're pretty standard for the employee ticket. Well, yeah, for all of these forms, it's pretty standard. But depending on how complex the product is, you might need you know more lines for direct materials. Some products you might need um, less, but the form is pretty much the the same. So you could do something that's um, pretty standard from one industry to the next unless you have something that's um, very unique. So if you have 500 employees and 500 sewing machines, then, and we're not making, we're not making the Barney um, bear, right? We're not making the Barney stuffed animal, which would be process costing, but we're gonna be making dresses, and we're gonna be making a dress for each of you. I'm going to give you a big discount, $24,950, I think it's reasonable. So each one of them is going to be costed out separately. So then it really, then it becomes difficult to track. And actually, when the operation is that large, it's done on the computer. So literally what you're doing is if you're at a particular workstation or working in a, a work cell, then what you're doing is you basically, you'll have a scannable, um, a scannable bar, barcode and you scan that to indicate what job that you're working on and it logs in, right? It knows what time it is. It knows that it's, but we're here to what, midnight? So, but it's, it scans, it knows what time it is and then when you're on to this, you stop working on that, then you scan that again and knows, okay, you stop working on um, Christina's dress and you spent 47 minutes on that. Base, and what it does, the computer does, basically enter that information on the form, right, on the um, an employee ticket. And then you go on to the next dress. Because you might be doing, um, one seamstress might be, there may be some sort of job specialization. Even though each item is unique, a, a custom dress, there still might be some specialization amongst the workers. Like one seamstress might focus on you know, working with the, the, the sleeves or um, stitching on the lace or, so, or something like that, right? So once that seems just all day long is working on stitching the lace, but each job is different. So on Benita's dress, it might take one hour. On Matilda's dress, it might take one hour and 32 minutes. <coughs> But each time the seamstress gets another dress, they scan that onto the next job, and that's how they know. Ultimately, you just go back into the computer, and basically the computer is filling out this form. And we know how much, how, how much time you worked today, what you did, which jobs you worked on. And then, of course, that all ties back to, to the job course sheet. And then we know, ultimately, how much did it cost us, what was the direct labor time for, to make that particular dress. Now before we go, what I want to show you is how to calculate the overhead rate. So let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, let's say, for example, 
we have a particular department. Because we could very easily have different departments. Like, for example, when we're making a product, we might have one department that focuses on cutting the linen. So somebody's got to take, you have this um, big piece of uh, sheet of linen, you've got to cut it down to something that's manageable. So you have a group um, of people that focus on cutting the linen. Then you have another group that's focusing on stitching. So each is going to have a certain overhead rate. Now what we could do is we could look at, we could use as an allocation base the number of hours, for example, that the sewing machine is being utilized. Because remember, what we're trying to do is determine how much how much each item is going to absorb of the manufacturing overhead? How much is each item going to incur for the plant manager's salary, for example? Because there's got to be a way to allocate those costs. We said that they're an indirect cost because we can't really trace it back. So the way to a particular product how could we say, well, the plant manager's salary should be allocated only to product A and not to product B or product C? So what we do is we make some assumptions. So we could use a certain allocation base. So in this case, we could say the base is how many hours the sewing machine is being operated. So let's take, for example, so the predetermined overhead rate is equal to the estimated total manufacturing overhead cost divided by the estimated total amount of the allocation base. Now, it's actually very simple. All right, don't don't let that um, throw you off. Because all we're really going to do is we're going to. This says the total manufacturing overhead cost, which we're going to say in this case is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. That's what we estimate the total manufacturing overhead costs are going to be. So the indirect materials and the indirect labor. Not the total manufacturing cost, just the overhead. $360,000. And then we divide that by the allocation base, which in this case we're saying is the number of hours that they operate the sewing machine, which is... 48,000 machine hours. So that's the number of hours that we operate the sewing machine. When we divide this, the 360,000, which is our total manufacturing overhead cost that we've estimated, when we divide that by the number of hours, we get $7.50 per machine hour. MH is machine hour. That's what I was alluding to before. Now that is tremendously helpful to us because now we could work through different scenarios as it relates to how many hours the sewing machine is going to be operated. Is it 48,000? Because remember, ultimately, we're looking at our course and we're trying to understand whether or not our business is going to be profitable. So what if the machine hours was instead of 48,000, 58,000, or 68,000, or 78,000? 
Well, we already know that we have an estimate of $7.50 per machine hour. So we just multiply those number of hours times $7.50. So we could go through those types of what if scenarios. We need to go through quite a few what if scenarios to understand what our goal should be and what's realistic. That's a large part of what we need to do as managers is understand different opportunities. So what if we got a big order and we had to run the machines, the sewing machines for 100,000 hours? How is that going to impact the price? Because when we get that big order, we're going to have to tell them a price. Now, if we were operating our machines before 48,000 hours and now we have a new customer from Yemen that's going to give us an order that's going to use 52,000 machine hours, they're going to ask us, well, how much are you going to charge me? Now, it's likely that they're thinking about making it themselves. So we need to give them, it's important, because what we say could make or break the deal. It's going to be deal or no deal. Right, you saw me on TV. That's me. <laughs> you don't recognize me? The hair is similar. The hair is similar. Yeah, yeah, the hair is similar, exactly. <laughs> deal or no deal. So we need to know. We don't want, we want to be able to operate our sewing machines efficiently. We want to be able to ideally to have, um, to optimize our capacity and to operate them seven days a week. But they're going to be, what they're also doing in analysis, they're interested in how this overhead is going to be allocated. So it's so critical. Again, you know, we always talk about price, but how could you, how could you set the price if you don't understand your cost? And I think what we talked about today, I think it shows that, yeah, knowing your cost is not as simple as you might think. When somebody says, well, how much does it cost to make it? It's not so simple. It's not just direct materials. It's not just how much paint you're using or how much linen, or how much plastic. We need to make sure that we're captured, if we're going to be profitable, that we're addressing our selling general and administrative, and also our manufacturing overhead costs. So then we could go through and we could say, well, what if, what if it was 100,000 machine hours? What would our manufacturing overhead costs be? And how much would each unit absorb of the total fixed cost? Because remember, the more units that are produced, the smaller the amount each unit is going to have to absorb of the fixed cost. That's known as fixed cost absorption. So you spread the fixed cost over as many units as possible, ideally. That's why General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, why they're and they had been struggling financially for such a long time is because they have significant fixed costs. A significant percentage of their fixed costs is tied up in their manufacturing facilities. Now, their manufacturing facilities were built in the early 70s when they were the market share leaders. When the cars that people drove in the United States were all Ford, right, all General Motors, made vehicles. But then as they lost market share to companies like Toyota, for example, and they lost a significant amount of market share, because Toyota sells millions of cars in the United States, millions, their fixed costs have, in large part, stayed the same. So you're making less cars and you're selling less cars, but your fixed cost, what do you do with them? You can't sweep them under the rug, you're, you're stuck with them. 
So either you're going to close manufacturing facilities or you're going to consolidate manufacturing facilities. That's why you see so many of the car manufacturers over the last 10 years have been combining. That's how Ford, for example, achieved that portfolio of brands. Why? Because they acquired. Now, some companies create a brand portfolio from scratch, like what Toyota did. They created the Toyota Master Brand. You know, we saw that in one of the video segments. And they created Lexus, was a master brand that they created. It's not something they acquired. And Zion is one another master brand that they created. And it's not that General Motors, that they didn't do some of that, but a lot of what General Motors and Ford did to build their portfolio is acquire other companies. Not because they were interested in marketing or they took this course or anything like that, but because they were trying to consolidate their operations so that they could spread the fixed cost over more units. Questions? Okay. Electricity, man. This is direct cost or...? Oh, so what we need to determine is, is the electricity for the corporate headquarters and the sales office, or is it electricity associated with the manufacturing facility? Electricity to operate the, uh, the equipment. So if it's in the manufacturing facility, then it's um, an indirect cost, presumably, unless there's some sort of way to track it to particular machines, but probably they just get like, literally like one bill, they know this is the total electric bill for the manufacturing facility. So that's an indirect cost, and then we need to allocate that. Probably something like this, that you know, this machine we operated 48,000 hours. So let's say it was 100,000 hours total. So 48% of the electric bill is allocated to product A, and then 12,000 hours out of 100 was for product B. So they get 12% of the electric bill. So it's going to be allocated. So that's an indirect cost that's part of manufacturing overhead. For the um, corporate headquarters or the sales office, that's selling in general and administrative. That's a period cost. And that we expense in the period that um, we incur it. The difference between the period cost and the product cost is product cost we describe as inventoriable costs. The reason why they're inventoriable is because, keep in mind that we said when we buy raw materials, whether it's plastic or linen, whatever it is that we're going to use to make the product, that is recorded as inventory. It's not an expense. So if we buy $250,000 worth of plastic, to make our product, we don't write that off as an expense. That is raw material inventory, that's an asset. So what do we do? We debit raw material inventory for $250,000 and then we credit, let's say it's cash. So we, pay, we, we bought the materials and we pay for it. When does it become an expense? When we sell the product. So that's why what we do is, that's why we're so interested in determining the total manufacturing cost, because we're going to use the total manufacturing cost to calculate the cost of goods sold. So when we sell the product, that's when it becomes an expense. So the sales and the expenses are being matched. And then we're going to make an adjustment, right, we're going to we're going to um, do some entries, some um, journal entries that are going to reflect the fact that now the whip was converted to finished goods and the finished goods is now course of goods sold. So we're not, we're not losing track of the costs. Any other questions? 
So now you know how much we're going to charge for sandwiches. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you have any ideas for uh, for a small business? So any idea that you have, you have to know your cost. It's not just the cost to buy the taxi. What about all the other costs? What about the money that you're paying for um, the car insurance and other fees and licenses and of course your variable cost, the cost for gas, all those other expenses. What, and then you have a dispatcher. So if you have 10 taxis and you have to pay a dispatcher, then so all of those costs we need to take into account so that we can make a decision. You know, if we want to do painting and you want to be profitable, because you're going to have to have, you're going to have to pay workers' comp insurance, you're going to have to uh, make payments on a van or a truck to, to go out to the customers, and you're going to have to buy ladders and all types of equipment and so forth. You need to know how much should you charge them to paint their house or well, mansion in your case. <laughs> Ten bedrooms. You know, one of the things they found that um, has really been an issue for people that have these really large houses is not the cost of the mortgage or anything like that. It's the court, like their electric bill. What about if it was a hotel? What about if our business venture was to open up a hotel? You have to, you have to think about, you know, what are your total costs going to be? Because of course you figure out there's going to be some electric, but how do we know how much the electric is going to be? So how do we know to rent the rooms for $100 a night or $100 an hour? That, but you need to know. Yeah, and the only way you can know what to charge is if you know what your costs are. We can do it. Yes, we can.